I've spent a lot of time living in Italy and eating delicious pasta, but I've never heard of cooking spaghetti like this until recently, so I absolutely had to make it, and trust me, it's amazing. Spaghetti alla Sassina breaks all the traditional pasta rules you learn from Nonna, so join me in trying this new killer spaghetti technique, but don't tell Nonna until you've mastered it. This recipe starts with a pound of spaghetti, a couple pounds of grape and cherry tomatoes, some store-bought passata in case I mess mine up, a handful of garlic cloves, a third cup of up, extra virgin olive oil, seasonings, and a quarter cup of tomato paste. As a believer in the slow foods movement, I always try to cook with minimally processed ingredients for many reasons, so I avoid using processed garlic and opt for fresh cloves instead. The easiest way to get these pesky skins off is to smash the clove with the back of your knife and then peel. I'm using four cloves of garlic for the passata, aka tomato puree. I did buy some store-bought passata in case these tomatoes didn't turn out well, but I wanted to try making my own from scratch by using this gorgeous assortment of colorful grape and cherry tomatoes. It's my first attempt at passata and assassina here, so go easy on me. But I absolutely love trying new recipes, techniques, and expanding my skill set in the kitchen. Usually I'll practice a new dish a couple times before making it for my friends and family, but I was in a pinch and we invited some friends over who are vegan, so I wanted to try something different instead of the usual version of tofu, tempeh, beans and rice, which I would typically make if I was making a vegan dish. Although I will say chana masala is one of my favorite dishes of all time, period, vegan or not. When you are slicing these tomatoes in half, it's important to slice gently and avoid smashing the pulp and juice out of the tomato. Let the knife do the work. You want, your, you want to use your sharpest knife blade here, and you'll notice I actually had to switch blades after a couple of tomatoes. After the knife has pierced the top, pull the blade back quickly without applying much pressure. I want you to be very intentional in this step to preserve as much juice and pulp from the tomatoes as possible before cooking them. Sometimes when cooking delicious food at home, it's attention to details like this which can elevate your dish. Ah, che bella tomate, the lifeblood of Italian cooking. I'm using a variety of snacking tomatoes here to make a passata, cooking them with a pinch of salt and chopped garlic. It's important to cover the pan and use medium to low heat for about 10 minutes or so. We are going to give it a stir or two and make sure your heat isn't too high because you don't want the tomatoes to brown at all. We're just trying to soften them a little. While the tomatoes are cooking, I've assembled my food mill which will help us remove the skins and seeds to give us that clean, pulpy, strained tomato passata, the staple of Italian cooking. It's been a while since I've used my food mill and this is definitely an extra step, so if you're in a hurry you can just throw the tomatoes in a blender instead. But I find this extra step to be quite enjoyable, somewhat cathartic almost. Okay, these tomatoes are looking perfect now, it's time to juice. A passata, also called a tomato puree in American grocery stores, is different from tomato sauce because it's typically just strained tomatoes and salt without any additives, preservatives, or fats needed to make the sauce. It's usually bold with tangy sweet tomato flavor and is a great pantry staple to start as the base for any sauce or soup. They're typically bright red, but because I used a variety of colorful grape and cherry tomatoes here, this one came out a bit more orange. Now that our passata is finished, this dish will go quickly from here. We need to dice a couple more cloves of garlic. Before you start cooking your spaghetti alla sassina, you need to bring about six cups of water, quarter cup of tomato paste, and a teaspoon of sugar to a simmer. Next, add your third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil to the pan and crushed red pepper. I'm only using a quarter teaspoon here because some folks don't like it as spicy as I do, but if I were making this for pepper heads, I would bump that up to almost a full teaspoon. We want to add our chopped garlic next, and I've made a mistake because my oil is too hot, my garlic is cooking way too fast. Burnt garlic is not good and can ruin your dish, but spaghetti alla sassina breaks a lot of traditional rules, and the charred burnt flavor is part of its hallmark, so I'm going to let this ride and see what happens. After your garlic and pepper have infused into that oil, add your passata directly to the pan. Whoa, chill out on that heat, dude. Yep, definitely too hot, but no turning back now. Whisk everything together and let's break the next traditional Italian pasta cooking rule by adding our spaghetti directly to the saucepan. That's right, we're not going to boil the pasta at all, but rather borrow the traditional risotto technique and cook it directly in the sauce by ladling cup after cup after cup of tomato paste broth into the spaghetti. While the broth cooks off, the bottom of the spaghetti will start to crisp up and char, creating a unique multitude of textures in this pasta dish ranging from crisp, soft, to al dente to downright charred, but it somehow melts beautifully in the end. You do have to make sure your spaghetti doesn't turn into a pasta brick while cooking, so every once in a while take a rubber spatula and separate the noodles as best you can by gently breaking them apart. Each cup of tomato paste broth should take about 5-7 to seven minutes to cook off, and after two rounds of tomato broth we're going to flip the spaghetti. This step is challenging and a bit intimidating, so to help, make sure you have two spatulas and loosen the bottom of the spaghetti at first before going full send. 
Once you have the spatula firmly under the spaghetti, stabilize the top with the second spatula and speed and use speed as your friend here. Make sure you commit or else you'll have floppy killer spaghetti all over the place. Look at that char starting to build on top of the spaghetti. It reminds me so much of tadig, that incredible crispy Persian rice dish that you need to try ASAP if you've never had it. By cooking the pasta this way, you create a fusion of sauce and noodle. The pasta absorbs a lot of the sauce, and the sauce clings to the outside of the noodle, creating an amazingly perfect chewy or crispy charred flavorful bite at the end. After you flip the pasta, it's time to ladle one to two more cups one at a time to cook the pasta all the way through. This hyper-local dish was invented in Bari, Italy in the 1960s. Quite a new Italian cooking tradition and has now stamped itself as a staple in the Apulian region of Italian cooking cuisine. As with any new dish, the true origins are unknown, but I like to think a Persian immigrant made their way to Italy, landed in the thriving port of Bari, got a job in a restaurant as many first generation immigrants all over the world will do, and learned how to cook risotto. Then, this clever immigrant was making family meal for the restaurant staff and thought, let's try doing this with spaghetti and, created my, and create my version of tadig, knowing that the blends of textures would become legendary. Voila, spaghetti all'assassino was born. Of course, the head chef took credit for the immigrant's ingenuity and the rest is assassin's history. Anyways, try making this next time you're looking to create a show-stopping vegan main course for your friends and family. I'm sure they will be impressed. As always, I believe if you embrace slow foods, discover new flavors, and cook with love for those you love most in this world, you can change your life.